Welcome to Excel Radio with Dr. Nick Zarowski, where we talk with world-class entrepreneurs, executives, and health experts who have unlocked the secrets to Excel Health and performance. Hi, and welcome to Excel Radio. This is your host and high-performance expert, Dr. Nick Zarowski. In this episode, Dr. Andrew Hill and I jump into a controversial topic, the topic of smart drugs and the natural form of smart drugs. Many people are using these in order to get in, get ahead in school or get ahead in the workplace. In this episode, we also talk about things such as keeping your brain healthy as you age, brain inflammation, and a good quality diet for a higher functioning brain. Dr. Andrew Hill is a neuroscientist at the company called True Brain, and he is also a professor at UCLA. Let's go ahead and get into this topic because you're going to love it. Thanks for coming on the show today, Andrew. Hey, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Hey, absolutely. You bet. So to, the first question I have for you to kick things off is, what is the difference between smart drugs and nootropics? Yeah, good question. Now, the term nootropics is used a couple different ways by people. Um, you know, classically, the term uh, was coined to refer to compounds that improve cognition, meaning memory, attention, or other forms of uh, cognitive regulation, and to do so without any appreciable side effects and with no uh, habit formation, no tolerance. And that's a pretty, you know, innocuous sort of category. Um, Unfortunately, as, as people become sort of aware that there's nootropics out there, the, the category's uh, name has been co-opted through more marketing. And so people are calling things nootropics that are not, that are really what I would call cognitive enhancers or smart drugs. Um, and so something like you know, caffeine would be considered a smart drug. It's, it does have side effects. It produces tolerance, habituation. Um, you can have cardiovascular side effects digestion side effects, you can get anxious on caffeine. So even though it's probably the most widely used cognitive enhancer or smart drug out there, okay. um, I would say caffeine, because of the side effect profile, manageable as it is, but still there's, there's some things there, um, it sort of rules it out from being a member of the nootropics uh, category, strictly speaking. If you're really using the, the original definition of the, of the uh, word nootropic, things need to not have any side effects, and they also need to be neuroprotective and protect against damage and protect against uh, issues with um, you know, other drugs, potentially. Uh, and so, you know, with that uh, setup, things like Adderall and Ritalin uh, would be smart drugs, um, you know, drugs that have uh, desirable effects as well as side effects. And you have to manage side effects when dealing with, uh, you know, prescription drugs, typically. And because of that, I think that... Uh, People should consider nootropic something you pursue when you're trying to improve a good brain. You're trying to take, you know, relatively adequate or normal function and boost it up a little bit more. You know, nootropics are not to remediate a specific pathology or diagnosis. For those things, we have actual, you know, drugs, prescribed drugs. But um, if you're just trying to goose your system or improve your performance or chase a little extra deep sleep or crisp attention or stress response or something with nootropic compounds, then I think you really need to consider the, um, the side effect profile as something that you uh, uh, just don't want to risk because if you're just trying to take your normal function and improve it, the, the consequence of side effects are dramatic. They take you below normal function potentially. And here we're trying to you know, go for peak performance and really high levels of function. And so if you're somebody who functions adequately but wants to function better, that's when nootropics come on board, not when you're trying to reme remediate a problem or fix a diagnosis. So I, I, I would say that smart drugs are something that's used for people who have, you know, like ADHD, for instance, um, where nootropics might be used for somebody who has some uh, distractibility. Now, of course, distractibility is a feature of ADHD, but it's the pathology, it's the diagnosis. When things rise to the level of causing problems in your life, then I think nootropics aren't necessarily the right approach. You know, nootropics are more of a, you know, they fit more into the supplement and sort of um, almost a, you know, there's, there's, there's many things we can do for peak performance. Nootropics are just one piece of that strategy. And I think they're a great uh, piece of that strategy, but they're, they should be considered along with things like 
sleep hacking, improving your nutrition, getting exercise, handling stress response, doing meditation, and nootropics. You know, they're not sort of a, a magic pill, no, no okay. pun intended. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an old movie, not an old movie, but there's a movie uh, called Limitless, and there's yes. it turns a TV yes. show recently. And th there is no NZT uh, nootropic. It just does not exist. Now, how that drug is uh, portrayed in the book and the movie and, of course, now the TV series, there are side effects. If you don't get your NZT, you start to die. And if you take too much of it, you have massive you know, physiological problems in this science fiction world. Um, that I was going to say, is that, is that real or is that just science fiction? It's just science fiction. I mean, certainly drugs uh, do exist that provide profound support to cognition and focus. Um, and when they wear off, you have withdrawal and side effects. But, you know, those are things like cocaine and, and serious psychostimulants. Um, there is no nootropic that produces this massive ability to, uh, you know, absorb information and perform at high levels for hours and hours and hours and hours. That does not exist. In fact, anything that alters you significantly is not sustainable. And right. all of the psychostimulants fall into that category. You cannot just keep having more caffeine. Eventually, it impairs performance you know the right the, the arousal getting more and more activated helps in performance a little bit initially but once you increase activation or physiologic arousal eventually performance is impaired and so all the psychostimulants have sort of an inverted u curve a little bit helps performance a little more performance plateaus and a bit more performance is degraded um and so there is no uh you know it's just not plausible that a substance would night and day change who you are and then when it wears off you sort of go back to normal things are either drugs of abuse that you have to get addicted to and and you know have, have other consequences or they are a lot more sustainable things you can do day in day out but the effects are much more subtle in the category of nootropics i mean if you take a psychostimulant an adderall ritalin you know big cup of coffee you feel it there's a subjective alteration of your mm. state nootropics um do alter your state, but it's a lot more subtle. And you tend to sort of go, yeah, I think they're, they're operating. And you notice them uh, operating in your brain more over many days as opposed to sort of dose by dose by dose. Uh, and I think that's really important to sort of uh, emphasize that there is no you know, magic uh, nootropic. It's not a, a pill you put in your mouth and suddenly your day is different. Right. It's support for you know, your high levels of output or stress or focus that you're already cranking through and now you notice it's easier to stay focused or you sleep more deeply or your stress response ramps back down more easily because you're handling uh, you know, uh, a calm focus right. set of compounds. But it's very much a different category than like a smart drug, so to speak. So. Okay. Well, I have a question for you then. So you said that the nootropics aren't necessarily for a diagnosis of let's say like ADD. They're actually, yeah. you're, you're saying that you're going to actually want like the smart drug or, or something along those lines for a, that type of diagnosis. But let me ask you this. A lot of people mm -hmm. that are just like, let's say just sluggish uh, as far as brain function goes, just get diagnosed with ADD. Yeah. And so will the nootropics actually help them or, or is it something that like you're saying is just not going to help at all? Well, I mean, it, it, it will help is the short answer. Um, that but to what said, extent you don't know? But what, yeah, exactly. To what extent I don't know. Um, we didn't design, I mean, uh, of course I'm involved with true brain, which is a, a blend of nootropics and we didn't design true brain to treat any problem. I mean, right. um, that being said, one of the heavy lifters in True Brain, the the Racetam class of drugs, which is a nootropic, uh, you know, category, um, Paracetam was the first nootropic, and then Oxyracetam is a later variant, and they're both in uh, True Brain, and Paracetam is used as a drug in most other countries besides the U.S. for things like ADHD. So, okay. yes, uh, you know, there's there, there's some benefit to be had if your attention system is impaired. But in terms of positioning a product and saying what it's you know useful for, the FDA would have a very significant uh, uh, you know concern if we started uh, advertising it as a treatment for ADHD. Oh, absolutely. So, right? so like, and, and I understand all the legal implications that go with that. So, really, what what I'm getting out of this is like you know we we're not gonna we can't really say that. But however. You know, according to what you're saying, that in other countries are using this stuff and it works yes. effectively. 
Yes, and all, actually all the ingredients in True Brain, all the nootropic uh, you know, uh, items we picked, including magnesium, L-tyrosine, L-carnitine, uh, DHA, paracetam, and civicoline, all of those things improve attention and can be used if you have ADHD. I mean, boosting your tyrosine system if you have ADHD uh, usually has an effect because ADHD is a dopamine uh, issue. And boosting the raw materials of dopamine, which is tyrosine, helps your brain manufacture uh, dopamine better and improves the signaling a little bit better. So yeah, it does have an impact, a positive impact on things like uh, ADHD and other dopaminergic attention problems. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's necessarily your first, um, you know, your 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 first choice in terms of treating a profound ADHD. You know, it might right. not be effective with a profound, a, a significant pathology a, as a psychostimulant. But, you know, also I should back up. I'm not a fan of psychostimulants for even things like profound ADHD. And in my world, if somebody comes in with profound ADHD, we do neurofeedback and it'll just eliminate right. the brain patterns over a few months. Right. Because there's uh, actually things that you can do before you actually go to the profound stimulants. There's a absolutely. lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, changing your diet to decrease sugars and starches, increase fats will affect attention. Hacking your sleep to get more regular and sound sleep will improve your attention. Nootropics will improve your attention. Neurofeedback will improve your attention permanently. Um, mindfulness practice will dramatically shift attention, but it takes a little bit longer. It takes you know weeks to do so. So there's a huge number of things, and you know personally, I'm somewhat uh, anti psychostimulants because we have so many safe and approachable uh, strategies that are better, I believe, than psychostimulants. Um, and of course, psychostimulants have cardiovascular side effects, blood pressure, digestion, suppresses appetite. People occasionally have cardiac incidents on them. So there's a fair amount of issues with psychostimulants as a, as a broad category of medications. Right. Now, uh, on, you know, according to you know, the, the different people that we have listening to this show, I mean, a lot of people who are listening, they're into increasing their performance. And, sure. um, and um, you know, it, it's all about performing at a higher level. But, you know, the thing is that's important that I teach a, about performing at a higher level is you have to do it in an intelligent way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I see, I mean, I see it on Facebook actually a lot where there's all these different um, advertisements for like a, a drug that is similar to the drug that you can, that they use on the movie Limitless. Um, mm -hmm. Is that what it's called with uh, Bradley Cooper? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. The movie. So, or, or the TV show now that's, that's the same uh, okay. con a con a continuation of the same world, so to speak, in a TV show. Okay. I got you. So basically like I, I, they compare it to that all the time. I think they even have a picture of like Bradley Cooper in Limitless. Yeah. So now is there a drug that actually compares to that or no. is that just made up? Completely and utterly made up, you know? Okay. Um, I mean, honestly, the kinds of effects you get in terms of subjective alterations, the world is crisp and bright and you have tons of energy, that's just a stimulant. Um, the ability to absorb huge amounts of information, to multitask with you know, five or ten different streams of thought, that does not happen. Humans cannot do that. There is no way right. to take yourself and to perform at that level. It simply does not happen. Um, and if it's something you could trigger in your brain, it would not be sustainable and you would have massive right. problems long term. Right. You know? uh, so no, there's, it's complete fiction. Um, human memory, uh, memory's meant to be imperfect. If memory was perfect, every experience you had would trigger a memory, which would trigger a memory, which would trigger a memory, and you would have this continuous cascade of experiences that would be really busy and hard to function in your day, uh, moment to moment. This actually happens. Um, there's a very rare form of memory, uh, superior memory called uh, HSAM, highly superior autobiographical memory. And people with HSAM can sort of think back to any day in their life yes. and tell you exactly what happened, what yep. day of the week it was, what they were wearing, what they had for breakfast. You know, those people, when they're young, this is a fun thing they can do, but when they get to sort of, you know, be a little bit older, Many of them actually suffer because there's this constant stream of cascading memories triggered by sensory experiences in their head, and it becomes just this onslaught of experience that is very noisy and distracting. Um, and so, you know, if we didn't have the ability to have our memory not be always on, then we would have a very difficult time pulling things out of our brain to use in the moment. I mean. You don't want to be remembering, you know, what you had for dinner last night when the tiger's chasing you. You want to be thinking, run, 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 run. Right. And, you know, the ability to not uh, have recall 
sort of intrusively put informations and scenes and things in your mind is, is helpful. It's, it's adaptive. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a little amusing now where we are as humans so complicated and sophisticated that we have to try to find, um, we have to try to find ways to, uh, you know, try to get a few more percent of performance at the very top end. But, you know, humans are meant to have variability of performance when the environment is not stressful, you're supposed to relax. When the environment is dangerous, stressful, or challenging, you're supposed to ramp up your resources. And that's what I think people often in a performance pursuit uh, sort of uh, perspective do not net tend to realize that their performance is always varying day to day, moment to moment, hour to hour. And a lot of what you need to do is um, hang out in the sweet spot, enough stress, enough sleep, right. enough challenge so that you are rising to meet your performance goals and stretching yourself and improving performance mm -hmm. as opposed to you know overburdening or underburdening yourself in both cases performance drops off you know fairly easily so okay very interesting so let's kind of talk about the nootropics then so sure. you had talked about some of the ingredients that are involved with that with that what are some of the main ingredients that are really like they really help boost the brain function. Yeah, so a lot of nootropics tend to have a racetam. Now, racetams were um, uh, initially synthesized in the late '60s, I believe, and um, the uh, uh, first racetam is piracetam, which was synthesized from the neurotransmitter GABA. The okay. story goes, and it, and it may be apocry apocryphal, but the story goes that. Research, uh, research scientists were trying to come up with a new sleep medication, and GABA is the only universally uh, calming sleep, uh, sorry, universally calming uh, neuro neurotransmitter. And so scientists were, were modifying its structure, trying to find a sedating uh, compound, and they found a very similar compound. They, they modified GABA a little bit and tried it, uh, and instead of uh, making people calm and relaxed, it made them focused and crisp. <laughs> And so it was okay. the wrong sort of, you know, they, they, were, they were unsuccessful in, in, in designing a new sleep drug. What they found was this drug that appeared to improve uh, focus, cognition, and oxygen metabolism in the brain. And so it was used for the next several years as a hangover remedy and a, 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 a head trauma, you know, sort of drug when people were recovering from head injuries or near drowning events where they had an oxy oxygen starvation uh, event to the brain, hypoxia. So it was used uh, like that in Belgium and Russia for many years until it became a more broadly used drug for things like attention and focus. Um, but all of the, all of the racetams uh, are sort of synthesized in this way. It started off with, with the neurotransmitter GABA, and then paracetam was derived from that, and many of the other nootropics, uh, especially the racetam class, have been derived from paracetam. And that is still one of the heavy lifters in our true brain product, uh, in the, in the capsule product, we have, uh, paracetam, which we still think is among the better, uh, nootropic choices for people to start with. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the most gentle, has the fewest side effects, is very, uh, you know, very non-toxic, very safe. You can't overdose on paracetam. There okay. is no ability to take enough to kill yourself. It's the, the LD50, the toxicity of paracetam is so, uh, the 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 weight for the LD50, the amount is so high, you're physically unable to eat enough for it to be toxic. Um, okay, gotcha. So it's just you know that's one of the reasons we chose it as a great you know really robust, really safe, long term uh, uh, evidence of, of safety and efficacy. And then a, a slightly newer racetam is oxy racetam, and it's a tiny bit more stimulating. Um, you know we don't really understand the full differences between paracetam and oxy racetam, but Piracetam seems to have a little more focus on verbal fluency and word access and memory. Mm -hmm. And oxyracetam seems to be a little bit more about visual focus and enjoying sensory things like colors or sounds. Um, and it's a tiny bit more stimulating. So we, uh, True Brain created a, a, a drink nootropic as well. And the drinks contain uh, piracetam and oxyracetam to give people that slightly stimulation effect they expect when they go after... Um, you know, a, an energy drink or something. This is not an energy drink. It's a think drink, we're calling it. But uh, we thought having a slightly more stimulating uh, set of compounds in the drink version made sense. And we also put a little bit of caffeine in the, in the drink versions that we do not put in the capsule versions. Okay. Just to match the experience of drinking something with caffeine, you know, we're trying to compete with like the coffee overuse as well as the Red Bulls. 
Right, right. Absolutely. Now, is there any other heavy lifters that you use in there, or is that pretty much it? Now, um, the race of Tims are definitely the heavy lifter. The other sort of uh, really important part of a nootropic a regimen is a choline source. Choline is used in cell membranes, but it's also used as the raw material to make the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and acetylcholine yes. is necessary for attention and memory. Uh, cholinergic issues in long, you know, late in life include things like Alzheimer's. Those are death of choline neurons. And uh, so we use a form of choline in true brain called citacholine in the capsules and alpha GPC choline mm -hmm. in the drinks. Um, and they're very similar, but both of them seem to increase uh, the use of choline by the brain and theoretically will then upregulate um, acetylcholine as well. So uh, those are sort of the two, if you will, heavy lifters in our product is the racetam mixed with a choline. And then everything else we put in there is um, you know, nootropic on its own but tends to be in the product to maximize the effects of those first two ingredients. And those would include things like magnesium, which will uh, be useful if you're overly stimulated. It'll calm right. you down. But if you have you know, electrolyte issues in your body, adding magnesium helps cells fire more, helps muscles fire. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we're sort of buffering both the under arousal and the over arousal with magnesium. Um, we include L-tyrosine, sorry, L-theanine, which is a naturally uh, found compound in tea that tends to upregulate GABA in the brain and produces a very smooth, calm feeling. That's why tea makes you feel both alert and calm, while coffee mm. often doesn't. And what kind of tea is that found in? All tea leaves have All L tea leaves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, coffee does not, but tea does. And we actually, uh, True Brain's about to release, I think this week or next week, we'll have it shipping. A brand new coffee product, actually, and it's specially treated beans with a little um, packet of additions, which include uh, um, L-theanine and alpha-GPC, so a theanine source and a choline source, uh, to really give you the same smooth, calm focus from coffee as people often get from tea. So we're trying to help you hack your coffee and get an even better uh, nootropic effect from it beyond simply the, the stimulant uh, effect. Um, but in but in the True Brain uh, capsules and drinks, uh, let's see. I've mentioned magnesium. I mentioned L-theanine, which is GABAergic. We also have tyrosine. Tyrosine is the raw material to make the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is involved with learning and finding things interesting and salient. Uh, and so the tyrosine raw materials uh, may help boost that. And then we also have um, carnitine, which is a uh, used by mitochondria to pump out energy. And the capsule for version of True Brain also has DHA, an omega-3 fatty acid. Um, and we uh, get the DHA actually from algae, not from fish. So it's a, it's a vegan form of, of, of essential 3 fatty acids. Okay. In, uh, or omega-3 fatty acids in the, um, in the capsules. And then we just for shelf stability and taste, we didn't put the, uh, the fats, the, the DHA in the, in the drinks. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, the 10,000 foot view of the product ingredients. Right. Um, we were very careful to not sort of, you know, fairy dust and throw little tiny amounts of a huge number of ingredients. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So mm -hmm. like, I mean, you're talking about DHA and all these things. I mean, now what are, are, what are some of the major ones that are really important for boosting brain function compared to maybe some of the little ones? Yeah, I mean, well, the True Brain product only has seven or eight ingredients in it, which is okay. unusual because we have such large amounts of them. Yeah. Uh, we also don't obscure the amounts. We don't say proprietary blend and you know, yeah. good luck guessing how many. We tell you exactly what. So right, right now I just went to the website. I pulled up the drinks, for instance, and the drinks have 800 milligrams of oxyracetam, 500 of carnitine, 350 of tyrosine, 250 of citicoline. And we tell you exactly what's in them. So there's never any question about, hey, is what I'm putting in my body what I want to put in yeah. my body? And you know what if what if something really works amazingly well for you, but you don't know what it is? That's right. kind of a that's a risk. And then if some, I mean, in my experience in the supplement world, if people are hiding their ingredient uh, amounts, yeah, it seems to be pretty common. Yeah, it's not so much to protect their formulation. I I, I do believe it's more about they can um, put the cheapest, the, the largest amount of the cheapest ingredients in and keep costs down. Right. And just hide from you that you're doing that. And we really decided to play sort of. Uh, against all of the traditional things people do in the supplement world. So we tell you exactly what's in every packet. Um, we uh, are very transparent about the ingredient list. 
Uh, we did not include caffeine in the first version for the first year, the capsule product, because we didn't want to sort of rely on you know, blunt instruments to produce subjective feelings. We, what we really wanted to produce the, the nootropic effect, the sort of windshield wiper fairy that comes by and squeegees your world. Right. Um, but you know, because of that, it's not quite as obvious you know, if we relied on things like sugar and caffeine to really hit you hard. And people need to take True Brain often for like a two or three days before the effects start to really build up. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So like, mm -hmm. I mean, I see it all the time, let's say in the supplement world where it's like, let's say you give somebody DA, DHA and they're like, well, you know, I didn't see immediate results from it. So it obviously doesn't, you know, I don't need it. However, there's the research out there saying the huge benefits that it has. So, you know, when it comes to the nootropics, then what are we looking at here for time frame as far of as far as when we could expect to feel a result and, um, you know, what kind of results can yeah. we expect to see? So the results are, or the effects are a little bit different person to person. Right. Um, and also in terms of how quickly the effects show up is a little bit different. Um, the drink version of True Brain does tend to show up faster because it's a liquid. It's absorbed a lot, a lot more quickly. Okay. Um, and so often it's the, you know, the, the second dose or the third dose people feel, you know, the, the end of the first day or second day. Um, in the capsules, we ship them in a box with morning and midday packets for 20 days of the month plus four extra boost days for your extra busy days or something. Um, and for those, for the capsules, what we find are about half the people seem to notice it around day three, and the other half of people seem to notice it around day five. Um, and so, you know, as long as they get through their first week, if you will, before they take a break on the weekend, they really notice it by the second week, typically. That's where we get sort of subjective reports. Um, but you know, people often are used to chasing performance with stimulants, you know, Adderall, caffeine, et cetera. And they try, they try a nootropic true brain or another, you know, brand nootropic and they're sort of waiting for that same stimulant push. Right. And it's just, just not there. That's not what it's designed to do. Right. And so you've got to be a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, open to sort of waiting for more subtle things to show up. And it might just be that you got you know, twice as much done that day or you worked later into the afternoon before getting a little bit burnt out or you didn't you know, need four cups of coffee, you had three cups of coffee. Uh, you know, whichever, um, the, the, the effects person to person to person have to really be sort of against the backdrop of your life and your stressors and your challenges. Right. You should uh, almost like document basically is what you're saying is, mm -hmm. you know, try to document, say like, okay, well, what did I accomplish this day? And, and maybe compare like one week on the uh, nootropic right. versus one week off of the nootropic. Yeah. It's, it's somewhat subtle and it's more about, you know, how you're able to power through tasks and less about, right. oh, I'm on drugs and something, I feel something. It's, right. it, you often do feel it and after the first week or so. I mean, I feel every dose um, and people that I introduce it to usually feel every dose by the second week. But it's still very subtle. It's not like, oh, I had a big cup of coffee and now I'm, you know, jittery. It's it's more subtle than coffee in terms of the, uh, you know, body and, and brain feeling. But you feel like, you know, some lubrication was added to the machine and words come out easier and thoughts are a bit quicker and it's easier to sort of, you know, you're, you're just doing more of the things your brain was already doing. And so it's... Right. And it's just functioning more stuff. fluently and possibly yeah. even hitting a few different deficiencies that you had in your brain, correct? Right. Like that, that's sort of why we added things like tyrosine and magnesium and, and theanine. It's for those people who may have a defunct or uh, uh, you know, stressed out dopamine system or tyrosine or a uh, um, you know, uh, uh, chemical signaling system for magnesium yeah. or cell metabolism for you know, carnitine. These were all to sort of shore up if you will, all of the ways that I thought people might not get the maximum effect from the racetam class. Right. Uh, you know, when I when I was helping the, the the initial team at True Brain design this stuff about two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, I had been involved in tropics for a few years and sort of personally self hacking, and it was really sort of a truism that racetams acted differently on everyone, and you just didn't know what dose or which racetam you wanted to take, or if you needed choline, mm -hmm. or if you didn't. And that didn't strike me as all that reasonable. People would have this, you know, really dramatic, different effects person to person, um, because I wasn't seeing the same thing in other nootropics. I was just seeing it in the racetams. And so, after digging around about how I thought it might be working, what you know might be impairing or in, uh, inhibiting its activity, um, that's that was sort of the the rationale behind why we added all of the other ingredients to True Brain was to smooth out the. Inter-individual inter, inter variability and make it a lot more consistent, person to person. And I think we we succeeded because you know most of our customers 
have a fairly similar effect to other people now uh, on the True Brain product. And it does tend to act a little more strongly and a little more long. You know, the, the length of activity from a dose is longer than the race attempts by themselves. Right. I think because we, you know, maximized all of the secondary uh, metabolic, uh, you know, constraints on the on brain activity. Okay, so now what are I mean, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but what's like a really like good some really good results you've seen? Like, do you know off the top of your head what some of these have been? Well, they're really subjective thus far. I mean, we're certainly doing some research. We're looking at brain activity changes, and we have a we have a study planned. Uh, it's going to launch in a few weeks, where we're looking okay. at double blind, placebo controlled brain activity as well as attention yes. performance. I'm going to use a P300 wave study, yes. looking at you know, the, the, for anyone who's a neuroscientist listening, they they, they laugh. A P300 is the most classic uh, neuroscience uh, EEG wave. Yes, that's been uh, well validated for decades uh, or more. And there's a lot of caffeine research looking at the P300. Yeah. And so I'm going to examine True Brain uh, a capsule format, which is caffeine free, versus True Brain drink format, which has caffeine in it, versus caffeine itself as an active placebo, versus rice starch as an inactive placebo. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do all those four in a double blind, randomized fashion. And so we'll have some results, uh, you know, in the spring for people to, to, to talk about. But thus far, the the sort of rigorous data is still kind of trickling in. And what we tend to get is a lot of subjective reports. You know, people find that they, you know, they they do some things like the limitless story. They find they sit down to write a paper, and it often takes them weeks to write a paper. And oh, look at that! Six hours later, they were done. You know, right. or they find that they, you know, want to write a song, and the oxyracetam versions just seem to really open up that floodgate of creativity for them. And so we get a lot of very glowing, happy, you know, uh, yeah. subjective reports. But it's just that it's subjective. Yeah. So I can tell you what I experienced from it or what other people experienced from it, but it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's hard to sort of validate beyond a subjective report and it sounds a little bit, you know, snake oily to say how wonderful this stuff is. So, well, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I understand that too. I mean, there is research we, we understand, but on the same hand, like results are results. So, mm -hmm. and, and the proof's in the pudding. So, I mean, like a lot of people are just concerned about results. So yeah, the research will be great though. And you'll certainly have to keep, uh, keep me updated on that. So certainly. I, I have, um, another question for you. Now, mm -hmm. these can take some time to, to kick in, um, as we discussed. Now, what about a diet that is going yeah. to support the brain, um, you know, make, make the brain perform at a higher level, but also support what you're doing with the nootropics as well? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few things to think about in terms of diet and brain health. Um, the, the broad rule of thumb would be to avoid all sugars and starches. Sugar is never really helpful for your brain, certainly not in the refined nature that you know Western uh, culture has access to it now. Um, so uh, you know, Westerners, Americans uh, are replete with this uh, metabolic syndrome, sort of pre-diabetes, of course, and uh, that produces um, an increased risk on the brain uh, in terms of uh, you know long-term disease. Uh, metabolic syndrome or you know pre-diabetes uh, does appear to to be a risk factor in Alzheimer's. It may be a risk factor in Parkinson's, um, and so the best thing you do, can do to your diet for your brain is to drop all sugars out, and to uh, dramatically increase the, the the fats you're eating. The brain is made out of fat, and whatever fat your brain uh, gets access to, you know, from the diet, it will incorporate into cells. And so if you give it really high quality fats, omega-3 fatty acids, for instance, your brain builds all of its cells with really robust, yummy fats. If you, if you give your brain mostly omega-6 fatty acids, it builds it with these sort of crappy fats that oxidize easily, break down easily, give you increased risk of atherosclerosis and you know, eventually stenosis and hardening of the arteries, as well as inflammation in the brain from, from mm -hmm. these carbohydrates. So um, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly dramatic, but I think... Uh, Anyone with any risks of brain stuff in their life, as well as who are thinking about long-term brain health, needs to think very seriously about dropping all starches and sugars out of their diet, um, and needs to examine: Are you know, am I taking enough fats in? Uh, because that is often, you know, it's not just enough to reduce sugar. You really do need, uh, you really do need fats in there. So. That's interesting. Very interesting. What of course, are some of the maybe highest quality foods that you can eat that are just loaded with incredible fats? Um, like the most bang for your buck yeah. is what I'm talking about. Avocados. Okay. 
uh, eggs. I'm a huge fan of eggs. I think it's nearly the perfect food. Um, and you know, for anyone who cringed when I said eggs, eating cholesterol does not raise serum cholesterol. Yes. <laughs> in fact, eating saturated fat may not raise serum cholesterol in the absence of sugar, in the absence of ex excess sugar. Um, so uh, you're not going to drive your cholesterol up. And it, even if you did, there's really some open question of if cholesterol is even really bad for you. Um, you know, serum cholesterol. Cholesterol is an essential nutrient. Without it, you die. You know, and it's used to make every hormone in your body, as well as uh, cell membranes and things. Um, so I think it's been vilified. But I would say uh, avocados, coconut, coconut oil. You know, almost every form of coconut, um, eggs, um, and then there's some nuts that are high on the list in terms of brain health, and some that are lower on the list. And the 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 highest uh, sort of the, the 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 biggest stars in the nut world for brain health are walnuts and pecans because they have a very high omega-3 fatty acid com uh, uh, compound for very low amounts of omega-6 fatty acids. And uh, macadamia nuts are also up there too. But pecans and walnuts are really high, really good for you. And then, and then max, uh, macadamia nuts. And then you get into nuts where you have to be a little bit careful because uh, the omega-6 fatty acids are a little bit too high to have large amounts of, and those would include things like almonds and pistachios. Um, but you know, if you keep your diet full of uh, lots of vegetables, lots of avocado, lots of really fatty, you know, uh, vegetables, things like palm and coconut and uh, avocado, um, it's only only pro brain healthy. Um, and then if you minimize again all the sugars and starches, and that also means minimizing or eliminating grains. I don't I don't okay. think humans I don't think humans should be eating wheat, rye, barley, rice, oats. I think right. Westerners have destroyed or at least abused their insulin system so thoroughly and then, of course, their gut that most Westerners um, really shouldn't be eating grains because they have educated their, their enteric nervous system and their gut that grains are um, toxic. And, you know, of course, things like wheat and corn bear very little resemblance to what they did even 50 years ago. Yeah, and so we need to be specific here because a lot of people, like I can't tell you, and it drives me nuts how often I go around and I hear people like tell me, um, you know, they almost, like, they just want to tell me how they're gluten free. And I'm just like, who cares? You know, like yeah. <laughs> it's a little, there's more to it than just That's gluten. That's great, but don't replace gluten free, uh, gluten full foods with gluten free foods because they, well, you know, exactly you still starch, because you still have sugars and a lot of the gluten substitute foods are also full of things that are a little bit hard to handle. Right. Like, you know, cellulose or lots of gums. And a lot of right. people think that they get off the gluten and their gut is doing better and suddenly they're having more issues because they're really sensitive to all the gums and these fake bread products and things. Yes. So, you know, if you're going to go gluten-free or starch-free or, or, or grain-free, that's great. Go for it. But, you know, you haven't been successful by substituting non-gluten version. You've been successful when you're eating omelets and steaks and avocados. You know, that's the, that's the right way to go, not when you're eating uh, rice crackers and you know, sugary, gluten-free uh, bread. It's just not a, a sustainable solution. Absolutely. Now, what I see here, it's very interesting because I work a lot with cellular healing and the same things that are good for the brain that we're talking about in these nootropics are also uh, in a way good for the, the cell. So we're talking about DHA and all these fats. So they're also very good for the uh, integrity of the cell membrane. And so can you talk about how, um, how the mitochondria in the cell is also very important to make sure you're feeding that the same uh, yeah. good quality foods and the same uh, good quality nutrients, just like you're feeding the brain in order to have the energy and function properly. Right. I mean, just like the body, inflammation is a killer, almost universally. A little bit of inflammation in response to an insult in the body is helpful, but that's not right. what we're talking about. We're talking about chronic inflammation that, is, that goes up and stays up. Yeah, for and the years. Body, you know, yeah, for years. And the body it leads to diabetes and cancer and muscle damage, all kinds of you know, increased cell aging and faster cell divisions, and you get to the Hayflick limit you know, to senescent cells that can't divide much faster when you have inflammation. Um, the same is true of the brain, uh, and so keeping inflammation down does appear to improve brain health. In terms of the mitochondria, you know, one of the things when, when cells are functioning well, mitochondria receive signals from outside as well as inside the cell. And mitochondria, of course, are little powerhouses pumping out cellular energy. They don't always work properly, and mm -hmm. occasionally mitochondria kind of break. 
And when a mitochondria breaks, it starts pumping out something called um, a free radical or reactive oxygen species. And um, instead of pumping out clean, if you will, energy, it's pumping out sooty energy that tends to damage things it comes in contact with. Mm -hmm. um, the mitochondria are supposed to listen for a signal that says, hey, dude, you're broken. Self-destruct so we can produce another mitochondria and put it in your place. When there's inflammation, when there's issues with so cell signaling that's you know, because of metabolic issues, that signal for apoptosis or programmed cell death just doesn't happen. And you get mitochondria pumping out free radicals on a much longer uh, time scale and potentially damaging the body and brain uh, more. And so things like uh, paracetam, things like acetyl L-carnitine, seem to help the mitochondria function better so that not only does it pump out more energy when it's healthy, but if it breaks, if it's a broken mitochondria, it receives the signal to, to, to kill itself off to make room for more mitochondria mm -hmm. much better. Um, and so it's not simply helping them function better, but it's helping them do, do all this house cleaning and housekeeping uh, when they do develop sort of problematic behavior, which happens. I mean, my, I mean energy is very volatile. And any organelle that's pumping out energy tends to do it, you know, properly, but also tends to have ways it can go wrong. When the mitochondria go wrong, uh, that's a big source of free radicals in the body, which, of course, rip through DNA and cause cells to oxidize faster and cause errors in transcription and eventually right. systemic inflammation, uh, body and brain. So right. uh, it's really important to keep these uh, inflammatory sort of cytokines down. And you can do so by eating high protein, high fat, low carb, low starch diets. Right. You can also do so by adding in, you know, racetams and DHA and other sort of good nootropics. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when we're talking about inflammation, we're the reason it's important is because most, almost all diseases, if not all diseases, start with inflammation. And then once the inflammation goes chronic, then you're seeing all the different diseases start to present themselves in the body. Exactly. And, and you know, some of the diseases of the brain, we're even thinking now, may actually be inflammation as the primary component. There's a, a couple of um, the sort of uh, mechanisms of depression. Uh, I've had a lot of recent research advancing our understanding of depression. And a couple of uh, major researchers are uh, now saying that they believe depression is brain inflammation. It's not brain inflammation as part of depression, but that's what depression is. It's a response to brain inflammation, period. Uh, and controlling it long term is the way to not get depressed and to not have sort of you know hippocampal atrophy through high levels of cortisol and inflammation. That's very interesting. Now I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I've been told you know you know diabetes type three is considered right. an inflammation Alzheimer's. of the brain, Alzheimer's. Yep. yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't know uh, enough to say that is absolutely true, but just like the body has a system to manage blood sugar within a certain narrow range, and blood sugar goes up, insulin's re released into the bloodstream, cells hear the insulinogenic signal, and that tells them to open up their sort of floodgates and suck in energy, and that drops blood sugar. Um, the brain has a system very similar, and its whole job is to keep you know, blood sugar in a fairly narrow, narrow tolerance, as well as to ramp it up or down very quickly when certain parts of the brain demand more energy, you know, oxygen and, and glucose. Uh, but when that fails, what you end up having um, in uh, you know, diabetes is low insulin or high insulin uh, in hypoglycemia. But in, in both cases, it's not so much, and, this, and I'm getting at sort of a regulatory strategy here, it's not so much the level of insulin you care about. It's the fact, does it change when you put stuff in your mouth? Mm -hmm. And does it change when your blood sugar changes? That's what matters. The absolute level of, a, of any signal in the body is sort of irrelevant. There's no such thing as having too high dopamine or too low serotonin. The chemical imbalance theory of mental illness, utterly bogus. It was developed from marketing in the 70s and 80s. There is no such thing as a chemical imbalance. It does not exist. What exists is failures of signaling. Like in the case of insulin, yes. it goes up and stays up. Or cortisol, when you're stressed out, cortisol stops fluctuating. It goes mm -hmm. up and stays up. And then all of your cells don't know how to handle a signal that's wide open, and they fail. And that's really true of any neurotransmitter as well. It's the signaling range you care about, not so much the absolute level. Um, in the case of the brain, if insulin goes up and stays up or goes down and stays down and signaling stops happening, that is going to produce chronic inflammation, chronic issues with uh, glucose metabolism in the brain, 
cells do start to die and um, the likelihood of having that kind of brain sort of sugar imbalance, the type 3 diabetes, if you will, uh, is dramatically increased if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So the pancreatic insulin system in the body is not tightly coupled to the one in the brain, but it's not decoupled either. And so if you abuse your body's insulin system through you know, eating every pizza and ice cream in the world for you know, many, many years, you will actually stress out your brain's sugar system too, and eventually it will have problems regulating and you will develop diabetes, if you will, of the brain and you know, inflammation, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So uh, you know, sugar is a, is, is a much bigger problem, I think, than we have uh, realized historically and only Absolutely. in the past decade are we really sort of realizing that it's the big driver for all of the diseases of aging, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, at least partially is brain inflammation and sugar as a major culprit. Um, and so I think that we are going to be able to, uh, in the next couple of decades, I mean, you know, I don't know how old you are, but um, he, uh, Westerners, Americans specifically, have been getting fatter and fatter and fatter since the late 70s. Absolutely. Um, I hold out hope that in, in our lifetimes, all that bad education and bad, you know, pseudoscience that snuck into food products in the 80s, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see the trend reverse. Well, well the next couple it, of decades, we get thinner. You know? Yeah, and I'm already, like, you know, I'm thinking it's already reversing. Um, uh -huh. It's starting to reverse itself. I mean, I, I, you know, I've lived in many different places around the country, and, you know, I totally see health food stores popping up everywhere. I mean, even in, you know, like, I live in the north right now in Michigan, and and I see, you know, health food stores popping up here, which, you know, compared to, you know, the South or California, um, the South as in like, you know, Atlanta area or California, like people are way more unhealthy here in Michigan. And, but it's starting to even, the trend is starting to move this way as well. Sure. And, and, and I really, and, and you also see uh, a lot of big companies. So for instance, like, I mean, let's talk about even pizza and I know pizza isn't a health food by any means, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know, you look at some of these pizza companies, even they're starting to like be concerned about the ingredients in their pizza. So absolutely. Um, or even McDonald's is now producing a, a you know, low calorie menus, salad based menus. You know, McDonald's is probably the worst fast food in the planet. And right. even they are starting to, to realize that they need to uh, you know, kowtow to the nutrition standards that their their users are starting to find important, which is, I think, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So everything we talked about here was all about, talk, you know, performing at a higher level. Yeah. And so is there anything else that is very important to a high performer, anything else that they should know um, before we get off this call? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing that we haven't talked a lot about is sleep. Okay. Uh, Sleep is among the, the easiest things in terms of, you know, you have control over it. It's cheap to, to try to work on. Um, and it has a massive impact. Uh, you know, people between ages 20 and 35 or something are the most sleep-deprived population in the country. Um, it's a major, major health risk. A sleep-deprived brain, like college student level sleep deprivation, just a few nights of sleep, you know, that is imperfect produces a type of brain that looks an awful lot like a depressed brain, the same kind of inflammation, the same kind of frontal asymmetries shifting around that happen in depression. Uh, a little bit of sleep deprivation looks like a depressed brain. And so it's really, really important that you get adequate sleep, deep enough sleep, you go to bed and transition into sleep without a lot of distractions, you get you know, six to eight hours a night. Um, mm -hmm. That's fairly critical in terms of uh, promoting brain health and keeping your resiliency. And resiliency is a huge component for high performance. I mean, high, performing at a high level means performing across many different types of challenges mm -hmm. and shifting gears very quickly. And that is taxing. The brain does not like to do different, different tasks one after right. the other. Cognitive fatigue creeps in and you just don't want to deal with your work anymore. Um, resilience helps that. And having more you know, deep sleep, making sure you actually get some dreaming, don't drink alcohol every night, don't smoke weed every night, uh, and make sure that you get some quality sleep. And if your sleep is not good, if you have apnea, or if you're not able to stay asleep or fall asleep at will, if you're waking up early in the morning, there's lots of things you can do to hack your sleep, including um, you know, mindfulness meditation practices for improving sleep, and of course a big heavy lifter, a big, you know, very effective tool for sleep uh, re-regulation would be EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback. So you know, your sleep is among the most critical things uh, in terms of brain health. 
people often under uh, emphasize how important it is in their own lives. It's ah, you know, whatever. I'm a little tired today. Who cares? I'll have more coffee, uh, more 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 coffee or caffeine. Um, that's not okay. It's it's making. Uh, uh, an impact on your performance, not only in that day or the next day or later on that week, but potentially decades from now. So being yeah. chronically sleep deprived for a year or two or three or four in college could mean dramatically different brain performance 20 years later. So it's a much more important thing to keep track of and manage, just like you wouldn't, you know, if you find yourself eating ice cream for every meal for a few weeks, you might go, you know, this spare tire I've developed and this low energy that I have, these cavities yeah. are a sign that I might not want to keep doing this. Right. The, the yeah. chronic, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. Oh, this meeting's too long. I'm getting tired. Those sorts of cues are important to listen to, that you need to be able to have enough energy sort of restored at night. You know, the, the brain washes itself with uh, cerebral spinal fluid. It's like, kind of like a car wash at night. And all those toxins get sort of sloughed off and pulled out uh, of the brain. As well as deep learning, you know, it requires sleep to consolidate memory. And if you aren't sleeping well or sleeping enough, you aren't learning. Stress stays up, cortisol stays up, insulin stays up. Um, uh, uh, the chronic sort of stressors beyond cortisol, all the inflammatory cytokines, those all stay up if you aren't sleeping. So, um, first thing to look at, you know, it, beyond diet, which is of course also pretty obvious in our lives, is sleep. And if you get your diet fixed and your sleep fixed and you're still not performing where you want to be, that's when you do things like you know, start a meditation practice, yeah. you know, engage some neurofeedback, look at nootropics. Now you can really start hacking and, 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 and improving. But you aren't going to know what your super normal sort of, you know, uh, abilities are if you aren't at baseline. And, and the lack of regulated sleep and a lack of good diet means that you're not even at your baseline, let alone trying to go for superior performance. Absolutely. And, you know, for anyone interested in learning more about that, we actually have a whole episode. It was one of the earlier episodes that we did. It's all on sleep. And then there's a, you know, I have a blog on uh, where we talk about mindful meditation. So a lot of these topics right. that we are covering here today, you can actually find them on the newvisionexcel.com free resources such as the other podcasts and the blog. And you're going to find, you know, how to do mindful meditation. And I believe actually, uh, you know, Andrew, you're going to be in competition for this now. <laughs> but um, the sleep episode, I believe, has been our most popular episode yet. So okay, um, apparently there's a lot of people with sleep issues. So oh, yeah. So yeah, now I mean, you're half, competing half for that. Clients have sleep issues, you know. Whether or not it's their primary thing they identify as a complaint, when I start asking questions, at least half have sleep onset issues, sleep maintenance issues. It's really quite common, yeah. Awesome. Well, Andrew, we really appreciate appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, you've just been a wealth of knowledge, and I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. And so um, we look forward to using and trying your product out from True Brain. Great. Thank and you. Yeah, I, thanks for having me. I really, uh, really enjoyed it. If you'd like to try the True Brain product that Dr. Andrew Hill has created, then you can use this special offer code, EXCEL. That code is EXCEL, and that is going to be useful to you on the True Brain website so you can get 50% off your first purchase. Also, if you appreciate and like this podcast, I ask that you share it on social media and share it with your friends. So many people can get great advice from this podcast and it's free it's free to you the listener so please share it with your friends and make it a great day if you want more information to multiply your health and simplify your lifestyle visit our website at excelpodcast.com until next time have an outstanding day